everyone, thanks for watching this video. My name is Steven and today we're going to show you how to make soju. I run a small business called Heisen House. I built a Makkali homebrew kit that I sell online. I'll put a link to it in the description so you can find it. And I wanted to try making soju, but I couldn't find any videos online on how to do it. So I thought I'd give back to the community, document my process and, and show you how it's done. I wanna give you a couple quick disclaimers. The first is that the process is really pretty simple, but we're gonna need some specialized equipment. I bought a beautiful two and a half gallon copper still on Amazon that worked out really great. Again, I'll put a link in the description so you can see exactly which one that I'm using. The other disclaimer is that I'm not a scientist. I don't really know what I'm doing any more than anyone else, but I did a lot of research on distillation. I'm not gonna get too technical, and I'm sure there are better ways to do all of this, but I'm gonna show you what I've done. So basically, when you're distilling alcohol, you're starting with a fermented beverage. And in our particular case, we're starting out with makgeolli, which is a traditional rice-based alcohol. And then we're gonna use this, the copper still to distill the soju. So the copper still that I'm using is traditional to the Appalachian region of the United States. So I guess you could say we're making some Korean moonshine. You'll notice if you've ever had makgeolli, that if you let it sit for a while, it separates. There's a clear part on the top, and then there's a cloudy part on the bottom. But what we're going to do is siphon off the clear part and we're going to use that. It's called Cheongju and we're going to distill it. All right, so let's get started. This is what I'm using as my brewing vessel for my makgeolli. It's an ongi. I got it at a local Korean grocery store. You can also just use a glass or plastic brewing vessel as well. I'm using a traditional two-stage process to brew my makgeolli, an yangju, and the first step is making a juke. So we're using this rice flour to put together the first stage of our brew. The, the really, you can find this at any Korean grocery store. The most important thing is that the only ingredient is rice. We don't want any added sugar or anything else. The next thing we want to do is disinfect our brewing vessel. So I'm steaming mine over a pot of hot water just to make sure that we're keeping everything as clean as possible. The next thing we want to do is sift our rice flour. We're going to be using one kilogram of rice flour to make our juke, and the process of sifting it beforehand will really help smooth things out when we mix it with the water. So I'm going to sift it twice here loosely. So I'll sift it once through my strainer, and then we'll sift it again as well. This is, is a little bit tedious, so I'm going to speed things up a little bit here. Perfect. So we ended up with a little less than one kilogram of rice flour. Now I'm going to put it in a pot and we're going to make our juke. Okay, so I've got my rice flour in the pot. This recipe calls for using about a gallon of water. So I'm pouring it in to my rice flour here. I'm going to pour not quite the entire gallon. I want to save about 500 milliliters of water that we're going to use later on in the process. But I'm adding the water in. We're gonna turn on the heat to medium to, to high heat on our stove, and we're gonna do a lot of stirring. So basically you're going to keep stirring until this thickens up. So it'll come out to a pretty thick consistency here and that's when you know you're done. After that I'm going to cover it and set it aside and let it cool off to room temperature until the morning. I'm actually going to let this cool overnight. 
All right, so while that's cooling off, we're going to prepare our Naruk mixture. This is the Naruk that I'm using for today. I bought it at a local Korean grocery store. You can also buy it certain places online. If you're based in the United States and you have trouble finding this, go to my website, shoot me an email, and I'll see if I can help you out. So we've got a little less than 370 grams of Naruk here. I'm going to add a teaspoon of wine yeast to my mixture as well to help kind of kickstart the process. And then we're going to use the remaining 500 milliliters of water from our recipe. So I'm going to add the water to the mixture here and adding it now helps to kind of kickstart the process. So it gets all the enzymes and the yeast mixed and flowing together and it helps kind of awaken our Naruk mixture. So I'm adding the water in and then eventually I'm going to go back to our rice flour mixture. I'm going to add this Naruk mixture, combine it with our rice flour once it's cooled down to room temperature and then we're going to stir it all together. You'll notice there's a lot of stirring in this recipe. So we're adding in our mixture. The yeast and the enzymes in the Naruk are going to feast on the rice flour mixture and they're going to break it down. There's going to be some fermentation happening and that's going to be the process that produces the alcohol. Okay, so I've been stirring this for about 20 minutes now and you can see it's already starting to break down quite a bit. So I'm going to take the mixture here, pour it into my brewing vessel and because I've already stirred it so much, it pours really pretty easily. I'm trying to get every last drop here and so we're going to transfer all of this into our brewing vessel and then we're going to cover it and store it in a cool, dry place for 24 hours. Okay, so the next day we're going to prepare our chop sal rice. And for this recipe, we're going to use 3 kilograms of rice. It's typically a 1 to 1 rice to water ratio. And the first step is washing the rice until the water runs clear. So washing the rice is really important. It will help remove any dirt, pesticides, any excess starches. We're going to rinse the rice until the water runs clear. Here it takes about 15 minutes to wash this amount of rice. And while we're rinsing, I'm going to tell you a little bit about chop sal. So chop sal is a glutinous rice. You can find it at most Korean grocery stores. It's really important to get the right kind of rice. So this is similar to the type rice that you might find in sushi. It's a very glutinous, sticky rice, and often it's referred to as sweet rice, but you want to make sure you get the right kind. After you've rinsed the rice thoroughly, you want to let it soak for at least a couple hours, and then we're going to set it aside and let it drain for at least 30 minutes. All right, so let's go back to our juke and take a look at it. It's, this has been about 24 hours later. I'm going to take off the lid, take a peek inside, and give it a quick stir. So when you take off the lid, you'll start to smell the alcohol smell. And we'll give it a stir. You'll notice that it's almost completely liquefied. We're going to come back to this and add our chop sal. Okay, back to our chop sal. After you've let the rice drain for 30 minutes, we're going to steam it in a bamboo steamer. So I'm, I'm loading up my trays and we're going to steam it for about 45 minutes. I usually don't start the timer until I see the steam coming out the top of the trays. And then again, you're going to steam it for about 45 minutes. The other thing you want to remember to do is rotate the trays. So about halfway through, I'm going to switch out the top and the bottom trays. 
and rotate it so it cooks evenly. Steaming is the preferred way of cooking the rice. It's also a little bit more traditional. You can also just use a rice cooker or cook the rice in a pot. This might be a little bit controversial in the brewing world. Steaming is definitely preferred, but if you don't have access to a steamer or it's, it seems too hard, you know, go ahead and use a rice cooker. Okay, let's go back to our juke. This is about 48 hours later, and you can see that it's actively fermenting. It's bubbling, it's making noises, it smells even more like alcohol. At this point, we're going to let our rice cool down to room temperature, and then we're going to add it into our juke. All right, so I've spread out the rice, and I've let it cool down to room temperature, and now I'm going to add it into our juke mixture. It's really important to let the rice cool down enough Otherwise, if it's too hot, it'll kill off the good bacteria we want. Okay, this is about 10 hours after we added the rice. And I'm just gonna open it up, take a look, and give it a quick stir. Usually you'll want to stir two to three times a day for the first couple days uh, after you've added the rice. Let's take a look. So I can hear it's it's bubbling, it's fermenting. I don't know if you can see, but it it, it also has a, a smell of sweet alcohol. So you can tell that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. The rice has risen to the top and I'm gonna give it a stir. One thing that I see a lot of beginner brewers, um, a, a frequent question is people are often concerned that it's not more liquid in the beginning. That's not a problem at all. So it'll be, um, you know, it'll, it'll feel a lot less liquid in the beginning and then as it ferments, you'll see it start to separate. So don't, don't worry too much. You see how this is very thick. It's not a problem at all. All right, so this is day eight, and I'm going to do a little test here to see if my brew is finished. So what we're gonna do is, is what a lot of people call the match test. This is not a scientific test. It's more of just a general rule of thumb. And what we're gonna do is, is light the match. I'm gonna place it down into my brewing vessel, and if my match goes out relatively quickly, that means that we wanna keep brewing. We're not quite done yet. And if my match stays lit as I've put it pretty far down into the brewing vessel. That means that uh, we, we're good to bottle and we, we could be finished here. So let's, I'm gonna go ahead and light this and we'll see what happens. Okay, so what you saw there is that my match stayed lit as I put it pretty far down into the brewing vessel. And so I could really bottle at this point and I probably would if I were going to stop with the makgeolli as my final product. But because I want to use my brew here to make soju and distill it, 
what I want to do is, is wait a little bit longer before stopping the fermentation process and, and bottling. I'm probably going to wait about another week so I can get some more separation here. Um, but again, if, if the final product, if what we wanted was the makgeolli here, I would probably bottle at this point, probably day eight, day nine, day 10, somewhere around there. Again, for, for my purposes here, I'm going to wait about another week before bottling. Okay, so this is day 15, and we're going to go ahead and bottle our brew. You can see there's some separation. There's a, a clear liquid that's separated on top. I have my bottles. I've sanitized and cleaned everything. I have a, a filter bag here, a funnel that I've, I've cleaned and sanitized. I use a an acid-based star sand sanitizer. And we're gonna bottle our brew and put it in the refrigerator for a few days to let it separate even further. And then eventually siphon off the clear part and that's what we'll use to distill to make our soju. Okay, so we, we ended up, after bottling, we ended up with close to two gallons of product here. So this is our makgeolli. We've got about two gallons. I'm not going to dilute it. I'm going to put it in the refrigerator for two or three days and wait for it to separate. The byproduct here, a lot of times people will call it the lees. In Korean, we call it jigami. I'm just going to see how much we have here. We've got about a thousand grams and there's a lot of things you can do with it. People will put it in their composting, you know, use it in the garden. You can also bake with it. I know there are a lot of beauty products now that include byproduct for making makgeolli, but there's a lot of different uses for it. You can make bread, cookies, soap as well. So you, you can do some more research and there's a lot of creative things you can do. Um, but I would encourage people to, to use as much of it as you can for whatever purpose. All right, so I ended up doing a second batch and this is what we ended up with. I've had it in the fridge for a few days to allow it to separate. And now we're going to distill. So I'm gonna siphon off the top part, add it into my copper still. And that's what we're going to use to make the soju. All right, let me explain to you what is going on here. So we have our still here, our pot, and it's full of our chongju. And what's going to happen is we're going to heat it up. It's going to, the alcohol will evaporate and come up through the pipes here, and then it's going to 
come run through the coils and there's going to be cold water in here and as it hits the cold water the vapors are going to turn to liquid and the part that we want is going to drip down through here into a, a container to catch it. We, we have a, a setup here. Uh, this is a, just a, an aquarium pump. So it's a submersible water pump. It's going to send cold water up through this tube here and into the coiled receptacle container and then water is going to get replaced and it's going to rise up and come back out here as it, it comes through the tube and it's just going to cycle cold water and keep this container cold and that's really important because you want the water to stay cold so it continues to help your distillation process so the vapors turning back into a liquid which is what we want to capture. Okay, we've got everything set up here. The temperature is rising. I've got it on about a medium-high heat here. You can see the flame underneath. And the pump is in full action, so it's got water coming up through the tube. And as it rises up, the water level comes up and it comes back out and it's just cycling back through over and over again. So it took a little while to figure out the equilibrium with the water pump to make sure the right amount of water is coming in and that it's not overflowing, but that the right amount of water is coming back out too. So the other thing you'll want to do is, is make sure that the water in here stays cold. So I'm going to you know, add some ice into here every now and then because the, the pipe in here will get pretty hot and this may even start to boil at some point. So you'll want to kind of temperature check every now and then and make sure uh, to switch out the water so that it stays relatively cool. So um, I'm gonna, the other thing you want to do is, is make sure you're monitoring the temperature. Um, so it, it'll keep going up and you'll, you'll really want to, to keep an eye on it the entire time. The other thing I wanted to note here is the Teflon tape. There's a, a few safety kind of things you want to keep in mind. You're dealing with a very flammable product that's coming out here. And you're also dealing with a flame. So you want to make sure to keep your final product pretty far away from the flame. In case you knock something over, you wouldn't want your flammable high alcohol you know, basically ethanol to get into this flame. I also have a, a fire extinguisher close by. So that's something you'll, you'll want to keep in mind. The other thing is the Teflon tape is here to make sure that uh, none of the steam or the vapors are escaping through joints. I've also got some Teflon tape here. It's important because it helps basically save your, your product. So you don't want vapors coming out here um, a lot of people will use uh, rye flour and water, like a mixture, and they'll kind of rub it along their fingers on the, the joint. Um, it's kind of messy. I, I like Teflon tape. It, I think it works just as good. The other thing is that, you know, you, you want to be able to, to take this off, the, the um, onion top. So if for, for some reason there's some sort of blockage in here, going to build up a lot of pressure and you don't want to have any kind of explosion. Okay so the temperature is still rising. My thermometer is not very accurate so it's it's really I can hear it boiling in the pot. The, the onion dome is hot but I can still touch up here so I know that we're not we're not very close yet. So usually at around 145 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you'll start to see the methanol start to come out. And that's going to be what people refer to as your, your first cut. And my, again, my thermometer is not very accurate. I think it's because the, there's, there's a lot of temperature and boiling going on down in the pot, but the temperature up in the onion dome is, is, uh, um, a little bit different. 
So we're probably going to see some of the methanol start coming out pretty soon. That's gonna, again, that's gonna be your first cut. And generally, this is a, a two and a half gallon pot, and I've got it about two thirds full. So generally, from what I researched, the, the first two ounces of a five gallon batch is going to be all methanol. And that's your first cut and you wanna just throw it away. So you don't wanna mess with methanol. I'm gonna go ahead and throw out my first two ounces just to be safe. It's probably gonna be a little bit wasteful, but um, I'm not an expert at this and I just want to make sure to have that kind of peace of mind. Cause I've already pre-measured using a scale. I've pre-measured two ounces. So you can see down here, I'm gonna get that two ounces and then I'm gonna throw it away. Okay, so my thermometer here is reading a, a little over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. I know this is inaccurate because everything I read says that around 145 degrees Fahrenheit is when you'll start to see methanol and in between 168 to 175 or so is, is when the ethanol will run. So I know this is inaccurate. Um, it's probably a, a cheap thermometer combined with um, you know, where it's placed on the still. But so I'm, I'm continuing to heat everything up and I believe we're close. I'm starting to see um, evidence that we're really close. This is starting to get pretty hot. Okay, I'm starting to see the first part of my run coming through. I don't know if you can see some very slight drips. It's coming down through the tube here, all the way down, and I'm catching it down here. So it's starting to drip, as you can see. I've got it dripping directly into a coffee filter. Um, it's probably not necessary for the first cut of methanol, but I do want to make sure I'm, I'm trapping any kind of partic particles that, that are coming through. Um, you know, any any maybe like chips from the still or, or um, you know, deposits from the, the copper still. Um, but here we go. So it's, it's dripping through. I'm gonna catch, my, again, my first two ounces. And then once that is through, everything else is the good stuff um, for the most part, for, for what we're trying to do. So there's, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, there's different levels of, or cuts as they're referred to in the distilling world. Um, I'm gonna keep it pretty simple. So I'm going to get rid of the first cut, um, the, the methanol. And then I'm, I'm going to keep distilling and until um, you know, I, I've got what I want and then I'm just gonna stop. Um, you can go through multiple distillation processes if you want a stronger alcohol content. Um, but at some point, once this finishes, the remaining product will start to get less and less alcohol content. So it'll be combined with water, basically. And so that's, once we start to get to that point is when we're gonna stop. All right, it's starting to drip through a little bit faster now. This started to produce when my thermometer hit about 100 degrees Celsius. So it's, it's still rising. Again, my thermometer is not very accurate, um, but I just, just for, for reference, if anyone gets a similar still, um, it, it started to produce a, a little after uh, it hit 100 degrees Celsius. So it's starting to drip through a little bit faster now. All right, I've got a pretty steady flow here. I've turned down the temperature just a bit to kind of keep things holding where we're at. And as you can see, I've got not quite two ounces here yet, but almost there. So I'm gonna get ready to switch out these containers. All right, I've switched out my containers. So this one should should uh, keep me, it should be good for a little bit. This is our two ounces 
Let me take it over here so you can see it better. About two ounces. This is my rudimentary um, beaker glass that I measured ahead of time. So this is, again, it's more than what uh, is necessary, but just for my own peace of mind. And it's just, it's such a small amount that we're wasting here. And so we're gonna fill up the rest of these glasses. I'm, I'm using small glasses at a time, so I, it'll help me kind of measure out my final product. And we'll uh, just kind of show you the process here. Okay, so I've added some ice. It's already melted, but I've added some ice to my water here because I noticed it started to get a little bit hot, warm up in my receptacle there. So I just wanted to highlight kind of how involved this process is. So you're having to monitor the temperature and your flame source. I've turned it down. You're also monitoring the temperature of the water here. So I've added some ice. And you'll, you're also needing to kind of monitor the flow of the water so that it's not overflowing here or here. And then you're also having to monitor your final product. So you want to make sure that it's not spilling and that you're filling to the right levels and that it's just, you know, there's no jams in your tubes or anything like that. So it, it's a pretty involved type process and you've got to be involved for the whole time. Okay, ended my run a little bit early. You can tell when you're almost finished because the flow will slow down and you can do a taste test and I, I, it'll start to taste uh, a little more and more watery as you get close to the end. These are 750 milliliter bottles, so I've got a, a little less than two liters total. And this is all pure alcohol. I would recommend cutting it with water to keep the alcohol content a little palatable. So I'll probably you know, mix these later on with uh, maybe a 50-50 water mix just to, to cut it down a little bit. And it, it'll help your product go a lot longer too. All right, thank you guys for watching this incredibly long video. This is actually the first video I've ever made. I hope it was helpful. If so, please like and subscribe and let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Thank you. Kamsamnida.